The Mandalorian Season 2 Episode 7 has finally been released on Disney Plus, and it was a really fantastic episode to go into the finale of the season next week. So I'm going to break down everything that went down in the episode, and how it connects to the other Star Wars TV series and films. Before we get into it, make sure you shatter the subscribe button with your seismic charges for more awesome Mandalorian Season 2 content. We begin right off at the Carthon Chop Fields, where we see the wreckage of many TIE Fighters and other scrap metal being moved around by similar modified walkers as the ones from Solo A Star Wars Story and on the docks of Trask from earlier in the season. In the Chop Fields, we see that one of the prisoners who is working hard doing manual labour looks to be a member of the Hask species. This is probably the criminal named Sart Julos, who we saw on Cara Dune's screen in the last episode. Julos is currently serving a 25 year sentence for shipjacking a New Republic vessel, so he's gonna be there for quite a long time. While also doing hard labour at the Carthon chop fields, Miggs Mayfield is very quickly approached by a New Republic prison guard droid who calls him over so that the New Republic Marshal, Cara Dune, can take him into her custody or the job we heard about last episode with Mando. As the two make their way to Slave 1, Boba Fett walks out of the ship and we see that he has now repainted his awesome Mandalorian armor back to its original state. Personally, I prefer it to be a bit worn, but it does look pretty awesome. We then also get a little joke where Miggs Mayfield says to Boba, you know, I thought you were this other guy because of the armor, but soon after, the Mando that he does remember walks out of the ship, sending a shiver down his spine. Hilarious stuff. Eventually, the crew board the Slave 1, and I have to say it's absolutely awesome to get a detailed look at the inside of Slave 1 in live action. Mayfield eventually tells the crew that he knows the Imperial clearance codes, but needs access to an internal access point to use them. To do this, he suggests that they travel to the planet Morak, where they are refining a substance called Rhydonium. Rhydonium was the substance seen in the Clone Wars TV series, which exploded and destroyed an entire Venator in a single blast, creating one of the largest explosions of the whole Clone Wars. As Slave 1 touches down on Morak, we see one of the Imperial Remnant vehicles driving down a dirt path which looks very similar to the clone Turbo Tank or Juggernaut seen in Revenge of the Sith. As the group is preparing to infiltrate the Imperial Remnant base, they all begin arguing and listing off reasons why they can't enter. Boba then says, Let's just say, they'll recognize my face. Which is obviously a reference to them recognizing clone troopers because of how important they were during the Clone Wars, but it's also a reference to Boba serving directly for the Empire and Darth Vader. On top of that, it could also be a reference to Star Wars Legends, where Boba Fett served as the commander of Imperial forces at the Kamino Uprising. I can definitely see the Kamino Uprising being included in the Bad Batch, and probably being referenced if we ever visit Kamino in The Mandalorian. After this, we cut straight into the cabin of the vehicle from earlier, where we get a confirmation that this is some variant of a Juggernaut, and we get a look at their awesome grey Imperial armour, which looks very similar to the Shore Troopers from Rogue One. The Shore Trooper armour design is actually based off a mix of the Clone Trooper helmet and Storm Trooper helmet, so this is perfect for Juggernaut drivers. Once inside the facility, Mando is forced to remove his helmet and replace it with the Juggernaut driver one, which is absolutely hilarious, and you can tell he's incredibly uncomfortable in it. As the two are driving, Fennec Shan says a small line which is probably just coincidental, but it is the exact same way the true Mandalorians led by Jasta Maril, Jango Fett's father figure, operated their plan of attack in the Jango Fett Open Seasons comic. Nice little callback to that awesome comic, especially since Boba Fett is also running the operation in the show. Following that, Mando and Mayfield continue driving their juggernaut at the correct speed to ensure that the Rhydonium doesn't leave a giant blast hole in the ground, but they soon hear over the comms radios that the other juggernauts are being attacked and destroyed by pirates. The two also begin arguing, and Mayfield mentions that he is a survivor, just like the people of Alderaan and Mandalore also are. He also however implies that Mandalore is gone, just like Alderaan. So either the planet was actually destroyed after the Great Purge, or like Bo-Katan says, that was just Imperial propaganda and scare tactics to keep surviving Mandalorians away from their home. And make sure you remember this part about Mayfield being a survivor, as it will be very important in a little bit. Soon after, the pirates eventually descend on Mando and Mayfield's juggernaut, leading Mando to exit the vehicle and fire back. After this, an intense showdown with a ridiculous amount of pirates goes down, with waves and waves of them attacking and trying to blast the Rhydonium so that the Empire cannot use it. While on top of the vehicle, Mando picks up a spear and launches it back at one of the pirates in an incredibly precise and deadly throw. I honestly think that this may be some sort of foreshadowing for the next episode, where he uses the Beskar spear from the Magistrate to fight Moff Gideon with the Darksaber. 
This, combined with the ending of the episode, which I'll get into shortly, definitely hints at a massive battle to end the season. Soon after, they are almost brought to the edge of destruction, but Mando and Mayfield are saved by incoming air support from a few TIE fighters. After this happens, we do actually get to see real shore troopers rush out of the Imperial base, being another nice tie-in to Rogue One. As the two walk into the Imperial base, they quickly spot the data terminal that they need to get the coordinates for Grogu, and Mayfield agrees to move in and take them. Unfortunately, however, he recognizes one of his former superiors from his time as an Imperial sharpshooter, meaning there is only one other option to go in. Mando agrees to move in, but Mayfield warns him that he must show his face in order to gain access. Din Djarin is incredibly reluctant, but we finally get the reveal we've all been waiting for. Mando removes his helmet in front of other living beings for the first time in many, many years. It really shows you just how much he cares about Grogu and considers him as a son. Following this, the two sit down for drinks with Valen Hess, and he asks them to toast to something. Miggs Mayfield suggests that they toast to Operation Cinder, which was actually Palpatine's contingency plan after his death to absolutely decimate any planets under Imperial control because he believed that if the Empire couldn't protect its Emperor, it didn't deserve to exist. Operation Cinder was first seen in the Shattered Empire comic and also Star Wars Battlefront 2. Mayfield also goes on to say that he served on the planet Burn and Con during Operation Cinder and lost his whole division as a result of the horrific Operation Cinder. This also explains why Mayfield said he was a survivor earlier in the episode. The officer then begins to talk about building a new weapon with the Rhydonium supply that will make Operation Cinder look weak, most likely a reference to Starkiller Base, and he also mentions the people of the galaxy wanting order more than freedom, an obvious connection to the rising First Order during this time. As Mayfield's former superior officer continues celebrating Operation Cinder and the death of Mayfield's fellow soldiers, he flies into a rage and blasts him directly through the chest killing him in an instant. This absolutely shocks Din Djarin, but the two very quickly make their way out of the building, climbing the walls of the base while receiving cover from Cara Dune and Fennec Shand, eventually making their way into the Slave One with a tense escape. As the Slave One is rising through the atmosphere, Boba releases the best sounding weapon of all time, a Void 7 Seismic Charge. This was of course first seen in Attack of the Clones when used against Obi-Wan Kenobi. When they land again, Cara Dune fakes the death of Mayfield, allowing him to roam free and escape his life of hard labor at the Carthon shop fields. Honestly, I would absolutely love to see him return again. This episode did a fantastic job of building his character and gives him a pretty big backstory for his time during the Empire. Who knows, maybe he'll show up in the Rangers of the New Republic show which was just announced yesterday. But let me know down below where you think the show is headed for the final episode. And to end the episode, we cut straight back to Moff Gideon's Arquitans class cruiser, where his officer calls him over to view a very important transmission. As the transmission loads up, Din Djarin appears and uses the exact same line that Moff Gideon said back to him in Season 1. That's a pretty big taunt from Din Djarin and tells me he's not going to stop until he gets Grogu back. Hopefully next week we go to Kamino. So that is my full breakdown on The Mandalorian Season 2, Episode 7 or Chapter 15. Thanks so much for watching, really hope you enjoyed the video. Cheers guys, hope to see you in the next one.